Okay, everybody. Well, thanks for attending this workshop today. And I just want to start by thanking Anna and Sherry for uh, being conveners of this of this series, and then thank my co-facilitators, Autumn Bonama and Billy Jekyll. Um, so our goal today is to share information on bioaccumulation monitoring. Um, our focus with these slides is going to be on um, fish and shellfish, but for you know, feel free to open up discussion on, on other um, biota as well, plants or, or anything that comes to mind and we're open to um, having discussions around that. And then uh, right at the start here, just wanna say that Autumn, Billy and me are all very comfortable with being interrupted uh, as we're talking about our slide deck. And so if you have something that comes to mind that you wanna chime in on, um, um, just maybe let's put it in the chat and then Anna or Autumn or, uh, can point that out and we can um, stop talking and, and, um, and, and, you know, have a discussion. Uh, so next slide. So um, for the workshop today, um, this is the agenda that we're, we're hoping to kind of stick to. Um, the you know, uh, goals of today's training are going to be presented. Um, we're going to break it up into kind of before sample collection and then have, uh, um, in addition to maybe any questions that come up during that section, um, we'll have a, a time set aside at the end to also have questions and discussion around anything that's been said. Then we'll go into a break. And then after break, we'll we'll get into kind of being out in the field um, and what's going on uh, during sample collection and then um, end with another section of questions and discussions. Okay, next next slide. And this is for Anna. Yeah, so we always just like to start acknowledging that everyone in this room is an expert in their own right. and getting an idea of who's um, in this room with us today. So um, there, there's quite a few of us. So why don't, if you don't mind, if you feel comfortable, add your name, affiliation, and if you're calling from someplace in particular that you wanna share, go ahead and add that into the chat. Um, and then <clears throat> if you decide to speak, just go ahead and introduce yourself real quickly so we know who's talking uh, before you add your comment or question. Um, so, and I think the next slide is mine as well. Am I right? Yeah. So <clears throat> we're going to use two types of polling platforms today. It'll mostly be Zoom polls, which are going to pop up and you'll um, select your responses and press submit. No big deal. There, we're also, we want to make a word cloud because those are fun and it's interesting to see common themes among responses. And so there will be a join slide that I'll share on my screen if you want to do it on your phone, you can have your Q, uh, scan a QR code and it'll take you right to the poll. Or you can go to a website with a code and, and join, and then you'll just add your responses and those will pop up. So I think we're going to be starting with a Zoom poll next. And we just wanted to start by asking um, what folks think of their level of experience. So the, the question and the responses are on the slide, but you should have seen a box pop up for you as well. And I'm seeing people respond. So I know it's working. <laughs> Love it. I'll leave it open. I think there are only two folks that haven't responded yet. So we'll give them another second. Either way, we've got over 70%, which is great. Okay. I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So another box should pop up. 
Um, we've got some folks with no experience, which is great. I love that you're coming to us first um, or among your first options to, to gather some insight. We've got some novice and advanced beginners um, and no one identified themselves as competent or expert, which is also great, but I expect you probably know more than you think you do. Um, anything to add, Wes and team? Uh, I think this is great. I really appreciate everybody uh, participating in this and um, hopefully we all can get some uh, shared learning experience today as we're, as we're going through some of the techniques. I also want to point out in the chat, it looks like we're covered for the whole state of California. We have like San Diego to Humboldt, so, and everything in between. So excited to be uh, uh, on the platform with you all today. And uh, so we can go next slide. So we just want to take a, a moment and kind of give you guys a little introduction to, to who we are. We're, um, we're located in uh, Moss Landing, kind of central California at the Marine Pollution Studies Lab at Moss Landing Marine Lab, and it's part of the CSU. Um, so we'll have Billy Jekyll, Autumn Bonema, and myself today. And um, so next slide. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Billy Jekyll, uh, field coordinator and sampler for the Marine Pollution Studies Lab here at Moss Landing Marine Labs. Um, I've provided bioaccumulation collections for the swamp and uh, other programs regionally and statewide. Uh, my main ex area expertise is uh, freshwater fish collection, but I also have many years in uh, saltwater systems, collecting marine fish and shellfish. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Autumn Bonema. Um, I am... My primary role these days is as the project manager for the statewide bioaccumulation uh, project, um, which goes by many names. <laughs> um, so um, I've been working with that program since basically since its inception. I think I missed a couple of the first months. Um, and I make sure that the samples are collected according to the sampling plan and the quality assurance plan. Um, I have studied on both sides of the coast, but um, in terms of collection experience, um, I mostly fill in where I can. <laughs> um, I don't get to get out a whole lot and, um, you know, it's because I have other responsibilities. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Wes Heim and I'm the um, project director and director of the Marine Pollution Studies Lab here at Moss Landing and also principal investigator for um, Mossane Marine Lab and San Jose State uh, University. Uh, so I've been working in environmental science for a while now. Um, you know, it was really my early experiences in San Diego, growing up in San Diego, going to the ocean and, uh, you know, getting, getting to see kind of sea life firsthand that really drew me into environmental sciences and oceanography. Um, Jack Cousteau, I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember that series, but that was like my go-to uh, and really inspired me. Um, and I just feel really grateful to be working in this field and um, and be able to be in a position to help and encourage beneficial, beneficial uses of, of, our, of our great environment. Um, and I think that's gonna then lead us into the word cloud on the next slide. So this, the information on this screen is going to be replicated here in a second. So I'm taking over, Autumn. Okay. <laughs> so y'all should see the QR code on the right. Again, if you want to use your phone, you can scan or you can go to slido.com and enter 3954824. And you'll be taken, that information is still on the left-hand side. Um, so using one word, if you need two words, great, but with word clouds, full sentences aren't good. <laughs> but what are a couple of words, what challenges have you encountered with sample collection? Anything under the sun is welcome. So we'll let this go for a couple of minutes. And as people enter their responses, um, we'll be able to see things pop up as they're doing now. If words get bigger, that means more people have added that same response. So 
We welcome folks to, if you see something that maybe you didn't think of, but you're like, oh yes, me too. I We also struggle with permits or whatever. Feel free to add it in so we can see common themes. Access always gets big. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah. Never easy. Mm -hmm. Safety, yes, very important to do this kind of work safely. A lot of situations. Any any anything else coming in here? Scheduling. <laughs> I think so it's small but uh mighty. I think cost is a big deal. It's it takes a lot. We the state board has to you know, contract with folks to to get things done and from people to equipment to analysis. Um, it's not an easy thing, which is one reason why we wanted to start this training series to build community so we can share knowledge and work with each other to um, fill in gaps as, as we can to make all of our dollars go a little bit further. Yeah, that's a great point, Anna. It's really nice to leverage. And yeah, this work does get so expensive, especially uh, someone put equipment up there. A lot of times the equipment, getting boats, access to boats is, is just really a challenge. And we've somebody put approvals up. Yeah, we all work within our systems and, and need the approvals. And uh, I can appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, uh, Anna, can you see if anything else is coming along or? We're, we're all seeing the same thing. So what I'll do is I'm gonna keep this poll active, but I'm gonna stop sharing. So if folks wanna keep adding to it, you're more than welcome. And I'll just keep it live for another couple of minutes and take a screenshot and share it or something like that. Um, if folks wanna add more, but uh, Autumn, if you wanna get yourself back. I'm working on it. <laughs> Oh, there it is. It's all you. <laughs> I couldn't figure out which one was it. <laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to start today with section one about um, before sample collection. And you can see on the screen the kinds of things that we're going to talk about. Um, and, and this is how we approach our collections. Um, and then here is Sunrise and Moose Landing. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing we do, you know, we've talked about in previous sessions, we talked about the monitoring plan, we talked about the quality assurance plan, but um, they're so important, I thought it was worth mentioning again. I'm not gonna go into how to set these up because we've already done that. But um, you have to have this base, in in my opinion, to, um, to really structure what we're gonna collect, but also, um, how to communicate with our field team. And one of the ways that we do that is, um, let me back up here. So I was going to say that the, um, you know, you, you, we determine where we want to sample the water body. We determine what target species that drives what methods and equipment we might be able to use. All of that information goes into permits, which is what we're going to get to in a second. Um, and then it all comes back to, again, the permits tell you what water body you can fish in, what target species are collectible, and how we can collect those. So we make um, what we call quick reference guides for the field crew, and there's a couple ways that we do that. Um, this is an example of, of what we call a decision tree. And we use this in 2018 and 2020 for the coastal work that we did. And we'll probably have something similar again this year. Basically, we take a table right out of the monitoring plan that says what the target species are. There's a, there's a supplemental page that has the size classes that we need. And then there's this tree for how, you know, what, what kinds of things might you encounter in the field and, um, 
how, how you can proceed. Now, this is just an example, and I there's a lot of stuff going on here, and I don't expect you to understand all of this, but or to read all of it. Um, just know that this is a tool that we use to communicate with each other. Okay, and then here's another tool that we use. This is um, specific to a more confined water body, such as a lake or reservoir. Um, and this includes, you know, the lake itself, where it is, who to contact, um, and then a little bit about the permitted species. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but um, the big important thing here at the bottom is that you've got the requests for the project as well as the um, Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. And it says, you know, this is what, this is what we're looking for here. And it, usually with our lakes projects, every lake is different. Okay, so uh, Autumn mentions scientific collection permits, and so we're going to spend just a little bit of time kind of uh, going over the process. It's um, if you haven't had to deal with getting a scientific collection permit, it can be a little a little bit daunting. Um, but I've put a lot of screenshots uh, through this slide deck and and can get you pointed in the in the right direction and um, and um, there's a lot of help actually on the website that I'll also show. Um, so here on this slide that we're in the blue where it says scientific collection permit link, that that's the live link to the California Fish and Wildlife permit site, which is what you're seeing on the screen here. That's their, their homepage. And you can see where I put the red arrow, that's the apply now button. And that, that's kind of a good place to start um, start the process. So uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, so this will take you to the login. And, you know, if you're going to be doing collections in, in California water bodies, crew, crews must have permits for take or possession of wildlife, including mammals, birds, nests, um, nests and eggs, reptiles, amphibians, fish, certain plants and invertebrates uh, for scientific, educational, and, um, and prop propagation purposes. And, and Fish and Wildlife considers take as anything that interferes with the natural behavior uh, of the species. Um, Wes, really quick, um, there's a question about uh, whether they need a, a collection permit within the reservation boundaries. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I I I lean towards yes, but I'm we're not in a position to kind of answer that question um, because um, you know that there's so much involved in that. Sherry, I don't know if you have any more to add to that. Oh, you're muted, Sherry. Sorry, my internet glitched. Can you repeat the question? Oh, we have a question about permits within reservation boundaries, and my and my um my comment was mm -hmm. that there that that may be that they still may be necessary if it's collections nope. in waterways, but that we're not in a position to answer that. Oh, was that a nope. no? Nope. Oh, okay. Yeah, That's no. a definitely nope. Okay. And okay. unless there's in you know unless it's an endangered species, and in which case you're gonna wanna you're gonna wanna coordinate that for scientific take, and then you can do that. You know that would be the only like like not, like Hitch for example. Those guys in Clear Lake within, are coordinating. Not within the reservation boundaries. Outside okay. of reservation boundary, yes. Okay. Even so if then, in Clear Lake, it's adjacent to not not in. Right. Yeah. That's what they're, that's their traditional use boundaries. Yeah. Um, yeah, Thank like you. We, we can, we can harvest elk on our reservation boundaries. We just need a permit to remove it off. So for example. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So the permitting is, is for anything, you know, uh, adjacent. Um, so, um, on this slide, we're seeing, um, 
um, that you're gonna need to start with uh, registering and that's the red arrow, the arrow there. So you, you, you uh, click that link and then if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so, so everyone's gonna need a profile and um, you know that's the principal investigator for that permit as well as field leads. And you're gonna need to provide some basic information that I've listed here, including qualifications, resume and, and references. Um, I've put up an entity ID here as well, just so you're aware that you can have an individual permit or you can, you can apply for a permit under your entity. If you're going to be doing a lot of different PIs under one organization for a lot of different permits, there's some value to starting an entity because it gives transparency to all the PIs across all of the permits under that entity. But you don't necessarily need an entity to get a scientific collection permit. And then uh, the next slide, please. Before we move on, I was going to say um, one of the things that we learned is that you want to provide an email that you'll have access to for a while um, because you can't update your profile. You have to start a new one if you need to change any of that email or personal information. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, <laughs> okay, so so this is a screenshot of of my dashboard uh, within the California Fish and Wildlife, and I just wanted to point out that um, so once you're once you uh, once you apply, you get your your user. Um, information you can log in and then you'll get to this screen and i just wanted this to be in the deck for for later on for people to reference you see the circle there all all instructions and so there's really helpful step-by-step -step, um, guides and so if we go to the next slide so these are the list of all the different instructions that are there for the different types of of permits and and activities that you could would do under this under this website and then next slide. Okay, so just to briefly talk about the different types of scientific collection permits. For what we're talking about today, we're really focused on specific use. That's going to be most research and monitoring. Um, the general use permits are more for education, collecting critters for a, a class or teaching purposes or aquariums, things like that. And then there's also amendments and renewals, which would be say you get a scientific collection specific use permit and then something changes on your project, rather than having to apply for a whole new permit, you can you can request an amendment. And those can be approved pretty quickly if it's just say adding another fish species or, or even if you wanna add another location, they, they typically happen faster than, than the, the submission of a, of a new permit. And then the renewal is if you have an existing permit and it expires after three years and you just want to continue the work, then you can apply for, for a renewal. Okay, next slide. Okay, so into the kind of the uh, main parts of the scientific collection permit, just briefly going over the submission. Um, sorry, my, my computer uh, was telling me my battery's low. Sorry about that. Uh, so to go into the um, permit information for the submission, I've kind of broken it down into into who. So so who's applying? What's who's the principal investigator? Why you're doing the work? So that's just a brief summary of of the project and what and what you're hoping to do. Then of course where you're doing it, um, what you're doing, what what type of collections you're doing, how you're doing it, what methods are you using. Um, how many? So how how many uh, how many things are you collecting or want to collect? And then timing. When do you want to do it? And so all that information goes into the permit request, and then it's reviewed. Uh, depending on where the location is, it's going to be reviewed by either the marine um, department or the inland fisheries. And then if it's inland fisheries, it's also broken up into anadromous and non-anadromous because uh, the of considerations like for salmon and other things um, for for fed, um, you know depending on what you're doing you may need um, MOUs um, 
So for California Endangered Species Act, um, it's required for authorized methods result in incidental take of listed, threatened, or candidate uh, under the CESA. And then the um, for fully protected species, it's going to require authorized methods that might result in incidental take of a fully protected species. For that one, if you're up against that, you may want to just try to move move your location if it's possible. Some of these can be kind of non-starters on on permits, but every situation is is going to be specific, and it's going to be reviewed. Um, um, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself though. So once once you so you're going to put your permit in, and then you're going to pay for the permit application fee, and now your permit's submitted for review, and then the review process will will take place. It's going to be reviewed by the California Fish and Wildlife staff, and they're going to send it out to regional biologists to kind of look at what we just discussed with whether there's the correct additional uh, considerations made depending on if there's you know endangered species or or threatened species in that in that situation and and that pro the review process can be very straightforward if you're working at a reservoir goes to one biologist and 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 those can be approved pretty quickly or there can be a lot of back and forth if you're in um um, anadromous waters, rivers, and, you know, other locations in the state. Um, but, but, you know, it is, it can be a back and forth process, but um, even though it may take a little longer, usually can resolve and, and, and secure your permit. Okay, next slide. So then, you, you know, you're, you get your approved permit, then you have to pay for the permit at that point. And then the principal investigator will, will sign and initial the permit. And so then you're into a post-approval, which then what is important is that that permit is sent out to all the authorized individuals so that everybody becomes familiar with the permit that's going to be doing the work so that you don't accidentally take something that's not approved or are working someplace that wasn't approved. So you need to know the permit conditions and approvals. And then after you do the work, the last step in permitting is actually reporting what, what you've done. And, and those are going to be typically annual, but it may be more frequent depending on, on the permit requirements. Um, so that was kind of a 30,000 foot view of, of the permitting process and, and you know certainly open to uh, discussing this more if anybody has questions on it. Next slide. Well, thanks. Too far. Thanks, Wes. Um, and, and then one thing I might add to the permits, um, it does take quite a bit of time. Um, some permits, you know, we've, it's taken over a year to get the permit. So um, give yourself a lot of time to run through the the, the grind of, of, you know, back and forth and, you know, different requirements. Hey, Billy, I have actually a follow up question on that. So sure. I know for the statewide program, it takes a year because we're doing statewide and it's really complicated and we want a lot of things. If in your experience, if the permit is more like centrally located and it's a simpler request, should folks still expect the like year long time scale or is, does a smaller, more um, a simple permit, can it get through faster? You definitely could. Um, it 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 kind of is based on what you're doing and what species you'll um, encounter. Um, sometimes, if you have a, a threatened species, um, it could if it's a federally threatened species, you are um, you you're you know sending in more. You have another MOU that with the feds that you need, and then also with the state. Um, so there's just more steps, and um, I think the. The NIMPS permit uh, National Marine Fisheries, uh, they take quite a bit of time to um, give you a permit. So it, it can take some time with even just one um, water body. Um, Sharon, do you have some? Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, one of the thing, the ways that we've gotten around permitting, it's not really getting around it, but is is partnering with other entities. So if there's tribes in your area that have already gone through the process for a threatened species, for example, because for scientific take in order to do survey or to, in order to do some um, some evaluations, then you might want to partner with that tribe and go out with them, you know, as long as they're with you. 
And we also have gone out with fish and, and uh, wildlife in order to um, to utilize their equipment so that we didn't have to have permits for shocking, for, for, for example, because they have those already. That was in our previous trainings, but just thought I'd put a hook in there on, on that piece. Yeah, yeah, collaboration is great, Jerry. And, and that's right. As long as what you're doing is in their permit, then you can then you can tag along, and I'm going to add to what Billy said with um, with permitting. I I would definitely never think that you're going to get a permit under six months, and uh, and then if you do, you're you're happy. But because there's some uncontrollable things too, like how many permits did the department get submitted, um, and if they get all of a sudden it's a a, a big year for them then you're just in a queue waiting for that review process. And, um, and then the timing of when you submit your permit as well. And so we typically, you know how we do, we do what we like to do our field season certain times of the year. That's kind of standard with funding and other things. And so, you know, they may be getting a lot of permits submitted in January, December or January, which makes that queue really long compared to if you were submitting a permit in July. Uh, when everybody's probably already secured their permits and is doing work. And so those are just some things to consider as well. Very true. So um, this we're, we're calling this plan of attack. Um, so these are the factors uh, that will shape how we approach our collections. And this is kind of the breakdown of this. Um, so permit restrictions can include dropping a site, but mostly restrict the gear type allowed Remember to always have more than one collection method available on a permit. Um, this is critical. One permit may have some restrictions, or one uh, method, excuse me, may have some restrictions that are environmental, uh, like temperature or conductivity. And uh, that could drop uh, based on the time of the year that you go out to sample. So it's always important to have multiple methods. Even though they're not the most effective, it's good to have that so you can at least um, you know, perform your effort. Um, most gear restrictions uh, are based around threatened and endangered species and their possible take. Some of these gear restrictions can be gear type, duration of deployment, and location. Uh, for example, example with salmon, uh, with, uh, salmon and gillnets, um, if gillnets are allowed to be used, um, we will have shorter soak times uh, to reduce mortality and avoid areas during salmon runs. So those are some of the restrictions, that, at least for salmon, that we see. Um, we look at environmental factors such as potential weather, uh, fire, anything that could compromise uh, safety or collections. Uh, we, uh, when sampling, like say for instance in the desert um, in July, you know, we we try to you know think about the heat that we'll experience, um, the storms in the North Coast. Uh, the Dixon fire was a big one for us. Uh, we had several uh, lakes that were not sampleable because it was surrounded by fire. Um, so that that actually um, last that Dixon fire lasted for quite a, quite some time during our sampling season. So um, it impacted us quite a bit. Um, uh, we will research what species you might encounter at a site. Uh, there's several uh, sites that that make that. Uh, relatively easy, some Google searching, um, just to find out what species you might find in that water body, so that um, you can um, you can assess whether or not the 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 gear that's authorized will um, result in unwanted take of non-target species. So you're looking at um, fish that you may not want to collect that may be just an incidental take. Um, we had a, a situation in the Colorado River with uh, large schools of gizzard shad when we were deploying nets, and uh, we had to minimize our soak time because the gizzard sh shad would come in and, and just hit our nets, and we, it was, took a lot of effort to get them out before they died. Um, endangered species of concern. Um, so if you have an endangered species, um, you... This is something that uh, our decision trees uh, permit uh, permit guide. They're very helpful to kind of let the samplers know that this is something they have to look for. Maybe that gear type that they're authorized to use, but maybe they'll have to switch something something else that's a little more selective. Um, you also want to think about hazardous species, so species that um, could cause harm to your samplers or to um, 
to your to your fish that you're collecting that your targets um so for instance uh down in san diego bay when we do trawling down there we run into round rays and they actually uh, they're very they're very difficult to uh deal with in a trawl net um i don't know if anyone's ever uh, handled a round ray but they can sting you from anywhere you grab them and so it's it's really difficult to pull the fish that you your target fish out without getting stung so next slide oh sorry uh after working through sorry go back. <laughs> after working through all these factors um uh and what methods are available we can determine what methods will be used and what's the most effective with the least inter incidental take and uh while keeping the uh, sampling crew safe and provide clean tissue samples. So that's our goal is to keep the crew safe, um, reduce inter incidental take and provide quality sample. Hey, I have so something quickly to add. Sure. It has to do with fishing methods uh -huh. and, and similar to what Javier said about, about fishing on the res, um, is moves into equipment. So, um, a lot of the traditional fishing methods, um, equipment on the res is, is, is fine, but off reservation, typically, um, you have to use what other people, the restrictions others have. Um, there are some, uh, like nets other than dip nets are prohibited for small fish, like, like minnows, et cetera. Um, okay. So you have to look at where you are, but in general, um, for inland areas, those kinds of things are prohibited. Just be careful. Um, we know that also there's some exemptions that can be made. So you would contact um, Fish and Wildlife in order to to set that up. Right. Um, and I don't know if anyone has any experience in that that wants to discuss it. Okay. Okay. Next slide. So uh, des desktop reconnaissance and site access. Um, so after we get our permit and um, know what methods we have available, we kind of get into this, um, you know, how can we get to our site and do we have access to our site? So I saw access was a big one. Um, so this is very important. Um, so for us, spending more time on, on reconnaissance will increase our chances for a successful eff collection effort. Um, we use satellite mapping software, um, such as uh, programs like Google Earth, uh, Topo, ArcMap, and LandVision um, to determine our access availability. So LandVision um, allows us to overlay our sites uh, on a satellite imagery with property owner information. Um, we use the software to determine site access permissions by sending access letters or call the contact for access. And when we're talking to, to the uh, landowners, we um, verify potential access points. We ask about lock gates, where we can access the water, um, current site conditions, things like that. Um, we also use Google Earth uh, as uh, it has a database of georeferenced satellite images um, that allows us to view imagery during the time period of time that we'll be sampling. So there's a little history uh, button you can scroll through and find the kind of a time period. Say you're sampling in July, and you can look at the at that imagery during July, even though the water months may be you know big difference, but you can find you can see kind of like what the idea of how much water is flowing through there. Uh, whether or not you can even get to the so the shore or if it's completely inundated and the shore is, you know, near the road. Um, so that's a very helpful tool. Um, we use Google Earth a lot. Um, with Google Earth, you can also identify hazards. Um, you could look to see if there's water bars, waterfalls, um, any kind of rocks or anything if you're on the water with the boat. Um, you also can locate hyd uh, hydrology altering features. Uh, near your site, like river inputs, um, pipe discharges, uh, water extractions, weirs and pumps. Uh, when we're doing surveys, we like to avoid any kind of major changes to a hydrology, um, you know, especially if we're doing some water chemistry associated with the bioaccumulation work. Um, through reconnaissance, uh, we'll make a day the day of collection. Uh, so through reconnaissance, we'll make the day of uh, collections run smoothly and efficiently. We like to say reconnaissance is 90% of the collection effort and 10% is the actual collection. So reconnaissance is huge. Um, so take the time. Um, sometimes we do site visits and stuff like that to, to put some eyes on it. So next slide. So basic equipment. Um, I'm a big packing list guy. Um, I tend to forget things. 
So um, we like to build a, a packing list for collections. Um, this should be a well thought out list of what is needed for successful completion of a sampling effort. What we do is typically we'll have, you know, the sampling crew will walk through the collection step by step, kind of do like a virtual in a parking lot collection. Um, this will help identify the field needs. We think about uh, the on-site sampling gear needs, sampling processing gear, and decontamination gear. Um, you know, the list will include, you know, pers personal protective equipment, permitting, access, safety kits, shipping if needed, sample processing, data collection, and um, decontamination gear. Um, an, an exhaustive packing list will lessen the stress before a trip and stop the weekend early morning wake up in a panic that you forgot something situations, which happens to me all the time. <laughs> okay. um, so next slide. Oh, this is for Autumn. So um, we, in our word cloud, we saw that safety was an issue. Um, and as we all know, when we go out sampling, anything can happen. So we do the best we can to prepare ahead of time. So here are some of the things that we consider. Uh, a lot of our bioaccumulation work has to do with boats of some variety. And so um, California, um, I'm pretty sure it's actually now required. So the um, when you're launching, somebody can come and check that you have the little boater safety card. Um, uh, the image on the side of your screen there is the boater safety course with the link to um, how to get to it. Um, we also have, uh, because we're part of the university, we've got a separate training that um, our permanent employees go through. Um, anything we can do to give them the tools they need to be safe out on the water, we try to encourage them to do. Um, when you're doing any kind of diving, of course, you need scuba certification, but specifically, um, we require research diving certification. So it's an extra step on top of your standard PADI. Um, that is a university requirement. Um, and it, again, it's another way to keep our employees safe. Um, we also like to make sure that before we go out, like Billy was saying, they do kind of a, sometimes they do a rehearsal in the parking lot. So they become familiar with the gear that they're doing. Um, it may be that they're practicing throwing a, a oh no, I've lost a cast net. <laughs> Um, I've seen lots of people practice cast nets up there in the parking lot. Um, and so, you know, we want to make sure that they're familiar with um, not only the fishing gear itself, but again, with the boat, you know, what what is its draft, its beam, you know, what are the things that could snag, um, you know, what kind of, going back to the reconnaissance, what kind of area you're going to be working in and which is the right boat for you. Do you take the prop boat or the jet boat? <laughs> you know, these things are, are important to know how each of them work and to be able to operate them safely. Um, there is also, um, we'll get to e-fishing a little bit later, but um, each of our field crew have to go through a specific e-boat training. And um, we use the one operated by Smith Root. I'm sure there are others, um, but our, our e-boats are um, manufactured by Smith Root. So we use their training. Um, and of course, we always have with us a plethora of safety equipment. <laughs> um, sometimes that's as simple as a rain jacket and a beanie. <laughs> and sometimes it's more like, um, you know, we have a, an emergency communication tool called SPOT. Uh, and I forget what that stands for. But basically, if something happens, this is a, a satellite device that's pre-programmed with messages. Uh, one is, hey, we're OK. Um, another is like, we need help, but, you know, it's not an emergent help. Another one is send a helicopter, basically, <laughs> right? And these are all pre-programmed to, um, to contact people's family if we're going to be in a remote location. Uh, we find that a really useful tool and luckily have not had to deploy its use very often, but it's nice to know that you've got it when you're, when you need it. Um, other safety equipment, we always make sure that we have life jackets if we're on the boat, 
a throw bag if we're anywhere near moving water, um, uh, you know, things like rowing gloves and oars in the boat in case your motor goes, like anything and everything. <laughs> Um, and you guys may have things that, that we don't think about, and we'd love to hear what you have, if, I, if we're missing anything. They mentioned this, the uh, Swift Water Rescue. That's a great course, um, especially if you're in river systems. It's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's always good to have that under your belt so that you can make those emergency rescues, someone's to fall out of boat or something. Great, great. The other thing that we do, we call it a shore contact. And this is somebody who is not on the trip, who knows where you're supposed to be and what the plan is for, if you're say you're going boating or hiking, when you're supposed to be back into quote civilization, <laughs> um, when you're supposed to be done with the work for the day. And we check in with that person um, when we're done with that. So they know that everything is okay. Now, typically this is, a loved one, but it can be a colleague, um, depending on what work is happening and what else is going on in the world. But um, that is something that we use all the time, whether we're hiking or boating, or you know, just um, driving down to LA to to dip water from a stream. You know, we make sure that somebody knows what's going on. Oops. So here, another thing that we make sure that's in our, um, we call it a boat box or a collection box or something. Um, we make sure that we have the ability to on the fly, do our best to identify the species that we're encountering. Um, so these are just some examples of field guides and identification keys that we have here in the building. Um, you know, these are always being reissued. Um, as we all know, species are changing on a regular basis because of um, genetic data these days. Um, but we always make sure that uh, we have the ability to um, figure out what we have if we don't know. Now, part of that is knowing ahead of time how to identify the target species that you're that you know you're going to be getting, um, and that could be you know looking it up online. Um, we often use a website called fishbase.org. Um, Bill, if you could drop that in the chat for them, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's it's a nice tool to use. It gives you a little bit about the life histories. It gives you some of the key physical things. Um, the The biggest challenge we have, of course, is telling fish apart that look very similar to each other. So I'm going to just go through really quickly a couple of examples of differences in some closely related species. So here we have some black bass, a uh, largemouth bass and a spotted bass. And of course, there are many others that look similar to these as well. But um, in largemouth bass, I don't, can you guys see my cursor? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the, I'll stop shaking it another time then. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, the mouth in the largemouth bass extends beyond the eye or to the eye. Um, but that's not always a great tool. The best one is to use the notch up here. Um, in a largemouth bass, the notch in the dorsal fin goes all the way to the back. But in other species, like here, it doesn't quite make it. Um, so that's a really good way to distinguish them. Um, a lot of people will pull a bass out and say, oh, it's got to be a largemouth or whatever based on coloring. And unfortunately, coloring isn't really a great way to tell because some of them can look really similar. Um, so again, with these two particular species, you're looking at that dorsal notch. And then another pair of closely related species, they don't look very closely related on this slide, but when you're out collecting, you know, the stressors change the coloring. And again, coloring is not a great way. Um, in this species, um, you actually need to count the dorsal spines. 
So the white crappie has five to six spines on the dorsal fin, but the black crappie has seven to eight. Um, and again, they can look really similar, um, especially when they're stressed. So, um, so we we develop a, a deployment plan, and uh, this combines uh, site access information and the basic reconnaissance. Sorry. Oh, uh, basic, Sorry. Recon <laughs> basic reconnaissance with uh, same our sampling timeline. So if click if you're collecting multiple sites, um, we determine the relationship uh, to other sites and build up uh, sampling weeks and uh, with clumped sites. This just makes our effort a little easier and we can go out and sample multiple locations or sites um, during a week. Um, we walk through the time needed to uh, for the collections. Um, so determine if it's even possible to sample a site and return in one day. We don't typically like to spend the night out at a site. Um, that's not the goal there. Um, if we have enough gas uh, to make a round trip, um, including uh, the actual time spent on the water collecting the site, we have sites uh, in the Colorado River that is a, it's a five mile run to the location. And then you're spending another couple hours uh, looking for fish and then an, it's a long way back. So um, you end up carrying a lot of gas. And so that's one thing we, we look at. Um, tidal concerns, um, if you have uh, locations, if you're um, collecting mussels, uh, you look at your tides and make sure that you can get there and get back out of there uh, before tides uh, turn on you. And and um, you also we also launch at uh, tidally influenced launch ramps. So some launch ramps you can only launch at a high tide or a low tide, depending on the ramp. Um, so you want to time your efforts uh, so you get back in the right time. Um, uh, if we're using gill nets, um, we look at uh, something that, that happens to us quite a bit. Um, you deploy your gill net, and if you can possibly recover that gill net before winds pick up, um, uh, current shifts, uh, a lot of times uh, you'll it looks nice during the day, you deploy your gill net, and then, you know, in the fetch of the lake, these wind chops pop up, and, you know, it's really difficult to pull a net in when the wind is pushing and uh, there's a lot of, of wave action. Um, it's best, so again, it's best to have multiple methods in your uh, permit to get out uh, when you go out to a site. Um, we deploy, uh, typically when we deploy a gill net, um, we'll stay at that site, at that gill net and hook and line uh, while that net soaks. Um, this just keeps uh, boats from running over, for some reason, boats love to go through the goal line. Um, so they'll run right through your net and uh, if they're trolling, they'll you know hook themselves on the gill net and then you have a bunch of angry fishermen. Um, so we like to st sit there and make sure that no one runs over the gill net and you can have multiple methods at the same time while you collect. Um, we, uh, we look for, for good structure in an in area. We usually ask local, uh, Am I getting a reverb or? Yeah, there's a little bit of feedback. Maybe if we all go on mute, except for you, Billy. Okay, sorry. Um, when, we're, uh, when we're looking for structure for our target fish, we usually ask the local shops and anglers, um, you know, what's the best spot to find, you know, say catfish. And, you know, they usually say, oh, by the dam or wherever, but it's always good to, to find out, you know, the local knowledge there. Um, cause you may think it's one spot, but actually there's a nice spot somewhere totally different than you thought. Um, we make sure everything on the packing list is functioning and ready to use. So we take that uh, packing list and we'll go through like depth sounders, make sure they're not cracked or anything wrong with them or, you know, and just make sure GPS and everything actually functions correctly. Um, we pack the truck with the following the packing list. And, um, one thing I like to say is having a solid, uh, plan keeps the sampling crew efficient and on schedule. Um, so next slide. I have something to add real quick to pay attention to is dam, um, dam release information. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. The discharge, you know, they, a lot of times that's online and you can, you know, get that through the, the water agency that's, that's managing that. And, um, sometimes they, they, it varies 
week or you know whatever day of the week it is and and sometimes you know it's based on rafting or um you know salmon or you know different fish i guess so this is our time for questions if everyone has any questions so far or anything else to add uh right. that that our group has maybe missed given your experience there was a quick question um, that we, know we were talking about, like I mentioned earlier, about the kinds of um, equipment that you use. Hey, Sherry, fish. your audio is um, really choppy. Maybe try calling in or do it in the chat. I prefer your voice, but the internet's not letting us. <laughs> okay, she's going to add it into the chat. Yeah, are there any other questions? I, is anybody willing to speak up and kind of maybe talk about how how you get ready for one of your sampling trips? Uh, we'd be really interested uh, if somebody was willing to to do that. I can talk on how we prepare. We haven't. Um, this is Bree Hernandez with the Bishop Paiute Tribe. Um, I started working for the tribe about a year and a half ago, so we haven't done any like fish uh, tissue sampling as of yet. But um, other things we do prepare for, so like if we do BMI sampling, um, we just make sure that we have um, everything we need so we don't have to go back out or like if we forget something. Um, we do bring both um, analogs so we can write down data both um, on our phone. So we have like, we use Utilize Survey123 a lot. Um, but we also bring um, notepads or notebooks just in case, you know, if you drop your phone in the water, then it no longer works. You're not going to stop collecting. At least I tell my team we're not. We're going to keep going pushing through. Um, so we do that. We uh, do have, uh, we do make sure if we are walking the creeks, um, we do state stage a vehicle um, where we're going to, we're anticipating where we're going to end. So we don't have to walk all the way back. Um, so we'll like um, have a, like every every mile we'll have like the car or every half mile we'll have the car stay stashed somewhere where we can actually access it if that's available on the reservation. Um, we are very fortunate that we have a lot of roads that or fortunate and unfortunate because then the water quality, but um, that we have, we're able to kind of um, stage cars in order for us to kind of move uh, a lot faster. Um, we definitely do like a little safety talk in the beginning. Um, we're looking into getting radios because that is an issue where we do don't get the communication for like emergency stuff that's happening in admin. Um, for instance, there was a lockdown that we had to go through and we're out in the field. We didn't get any of that. We just heard the sirens and we came back and it was like a lockdown. Right. So that's com that's completely crazy, like out of the ordinary stuff. But um, I think just being mindful of the things around you is is one thing that I'm very big, I'm not, I tried my best whenever we're walking the creeks is that we do it in teams and not someone's, you know, out by themselves, even though it's not that, um, you know, you, sometimes you get into like a foot of water, sometimes you're like below your hips, um, like or up to your hips. Um, but you know, there's also a lot of debris and that's one of the things that freaks me out with my team is like, if you can get trapped, like you can get your foot stuck, or, you know, there's a lot of like fallen things that you can like just get or a tree limb falls on you, you know, so that's why I'm always big about the team things. Um, uh, besides that, yeah, just making sure we have every tool. Sometimes we miss one thing or another and we have to send someone back to go get it. Um, but again, fortunately, the reservation here in that sense is it's, it's like very accessible to get to in and out of our water bodies. Um, yeah, it's kind of I don't know about <laughs> helped anyone but yeah thanks thank you appreciate appreciate that yeah you brought up a lot of good points that i think are, are important especially the kind of submerged debris uh mm -hmm. challenge when you're and, and i like the fact that you're doing teams for sure it looks yeah those things are so ingrained i just take them for granted but we yeah we absolutely do that too Nobody ever goes out alone. Yeah. It looks like Sherry was able to add to her chat, but do we want to try your audio one more time just in case? 
Well, I um, oh. I put it. In, it's gonna work. So I put it in the chat. If you want to read it for me, yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Pretend I sound lovely like Sherry. Okay. Um, this is for off reservation, of course, but related to traditional methods and equipment, there may be conflicts with um, fishing game wardens or sports fish fishermen questioning um, your methods, relationship building with local wardens, and potentially um, uh, regulating section of, of waters to disallow sport fishing in certain sections as possible. Um, if anyone wants to give some advice on how they've navigated that successfully, or if there are other, I'm going to add, if there are other challenges related to that, that we should, you want to discuss as a group, um, please feel free to share. Hopefully I captured that. that that's really great, Sherry. Um, you know, I'll, I'll speak to um, some conflicts with maybe other people or you know, it is, especially if we're out with an e-boat, um, you know, I think sometimes people don't understand, um, maybe have a lot of concerns that we're taking all the fish or, you know, um, getting in their way. And so we've had, at least personally, I've had some times where I felt like some people were getting pretty aggressive with kind of getting really close to our boat and and trying to put us on video kind of intimidation um you know and and you know the first thing we do is try to just take a deep breath and 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 not not kind of escalate the situation um and then just try to give as much information as we can to kind of hopefully make them understand that we're just we're not trying to take all the fish we're just taking a you know a few and and that we're going to be you know out of there pretty quick if they just kind of I mean we don't say this directly but just allow us to do our work um you know we'll be we'll be out of there sooner than later and so I think been able to kind of de-escalate most of the time some of the the challenges around that Anybody else have some fun stories to share around <laughs> sample collection and, and, you know? I just wanted to add that one of the things that we've started using for the statewide program is um, a little handout that we can give to people who come up and ask us what we're doing about and, you know, like, why are we there? What are we doing and what are we looking for? And we oftentimes get the question, well, how do I find out about the results of what you're learning? So um, Anna and her team made a fantastic little handout and um, we carry that with us when we're going. So um, it's a nice way to, to communicate without having to spend a lot of your um, staff time. <laughs> Anybody have any run-ins with, with wardens? No? Yes. We, we have, <laughs> Go ahead, Javier. Javier. Uh, I, I, there's a couple of things, you know, as in regards to like the science permits that um, I think Sherry's alluding to and in you know introducing or reintroducing traditional methods, traditional uh, ecological knowledge and sampling methods, because that's the purpose of the of the procedure, mostly for tribes, um, and that um, you know sometimes that's not popular, and I think that um, also the um, the public nature of the the permits too you know, giving a lot of information that might be uh, confidential to the tribe. Um, so that's another uh, caution um, that sometimes the the scientific methods of collections aren't always the correct way. Um, I've noticed uh, uh, even, you know, current collection methods um, are not um, are not good for the, the species either. So um, I'm, I'm 
I'm mostly on the coast, um, still collecting a lot in the, in the ocean, um, but also into the rivers. And, and so um, the, the public nature of, of a lot of that is, is uh, does have some concerns, does have some benefit, but it also has some concern. But I think that's kind of where Sherry was going with that. Yeah. Connected to that is how do you continue to pass on this tradition, traditional ways of fishing in their period. So that's where those relationships, the relationship building, um, perhaps some, some exemptions in some, some specific areas of water of your, of your traditional territory, that's going to be the new one. We're doing it on res, but you don't have a and reservation that you don't need protected under. Um, you're looking at wider traditional territory, which brings you in contact with those entities. Okay. Um, so does anybody else have anything uh, that maybe they want to bring up at this point or, or you know, talk about? I was going to have a question real quick about... Um, the u.s fish and wildlife permits as well okay is that is that does anyone have familiarity with that and the, the possible cross connection between the state and the federal yeah permitting? right so thanks javier that's you know i i kind of didn't get into detail on the on the permit slides but i'm gonna i'm gonna so this is at least for how we're operating and i'm not you know i'm not an expert in in the federal side by any means but it's like if if you're collect for us if we're collecting in anadromous waters then we need an mou a memorandum of understanding um for the uh cisa which is the california endangered species act mou it's required if authorized methods could result in incidental take of listed threatened or candidate under the cisa and then the fully protected species required if authorized methods could result in incidental take of a fully protected species. Um, and then the collection in water with federally listed species requires the NIMPS National Marine Fisheries Service permit um, and the Section 10 of the Endangered Species Act permit, similar to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife process. So if I understand kind of what you were asking is, is, is there the, you know, how do we go about doing the, the federal permits? And I think the, again, not being a full expert on that, but what we do is we get these MOUs started as, as part of the fish and wildlife permit process. Billy, do you have any more to add to that, to give more detail on the federal side, of how we deal with things? Um, mo mostly what you said, it's it's just based on our permit and our location. If the uh, state comes back and says, you're going to need a federal permit for this, we apply for the federal permit. We usually have them tell us. Um, we don't try to assume that we're going to need a federal permit. Um, that's usually our, our best approach is just to have them say, okay, this is requires this, this, and this. Um, they're pretty good about telling you. <laughs> So Javier, I don't know if that answered your question specifically or not. Um, yeah, I just was wondering if there was some uh, familiar uh, territory there. Yeah, okay. I have a follow-up question regarding these types of permits, et cetera. Um, do, you, do you notice that it's faster to get um, to review them or is this a whole new process each time? Oh, um, so Sherry, your audio is breaking up a little bit, but I'm, I thought what I heard you say was kind of getting at whether it's better to do an amendment to a permit or just to start a new one. And so if, so each permit is kind of under the project that, you know, so you're doing a project and then you need a permit. And so we, Unless there's some real um, kind of overlap with sharing funds or whatever, you can't just take a new project and slap it on to an existing permit. Um, 
So it has to be, you know, reasonably aligned with the existing permit if you're going to want to do an amendment. So the amendments we typically, and but that does happen sometimes. Sometimes where we have an existing project and then somebody comes along and say, oh, we want to do that too. Can you do that for us? And we can roll it in. But typically the amendments are going to be, you know, adding a, a new site, a new location or, or adding an, you know, more, more take or, or different take. And then if we're going to do another project comes along, it won't be an amendment. It will be a separate permit um, for, and then your question really was like, is it faster to do the amendment versus kind of a new permit? And again, I think that's really hard to answer. It's specific to what you're doing. Um, again, like we've had some very quick turnaround on, on reservoirs, at least in kind of Northern California, where, where, um, you know, it was non anadromous and it was a very, you know, just one or two reservoirs with, you know, a couple of different species of fish and, and the permit came through really quick. And that might've been because they didn't have a lot in their queue as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know how helpful that was, but. And then Sherry also added in the chat, like in addition to that, what about renewing the oh. same permit? Is there a difference in the, the speed at which it can get renewed? Yeah, that's, like that's a, a great time. question. I, I, there is. And so if you have an existing permit and then it ex it's going to expire and you want to just you're you know you secured additional funding or whatever and you want to just continue the work uh, my i would say that the renewal is going to be the way to go it's going to be quicker because if you're not changing anything really then it's basically already been reviewed by everybody and it should go through a lot quicker um and, and the process is still, you're going through an amendment and the amendment is uh, the extension of, uh, you know, years or because they're three, typically three year permits. So you would just be extending that. So there is a fee associated with that and then you know, the review process as well that you're extending it. Okay, uh, anything else? Any other questions come to mind or anything you want to discuss? Uh, I think we already discussed labs, but did you guys, I mean, in our last, the last time, did you guys want to talk about when you do um, catch them, whether you are keeping them, um, uh, how, how are you keeping them and transporting them to back into your office area? I mean, um, it's a, it's a new, that information, but. There's of course near to have it, but just just a thought. We do have, I think, further down in the in this presentation, I think we'll discuss like sample processing and, and storage and everything and how we how we deal with that. So it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In preview. I'm uh, saying. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we're. I think we're a little bit ahead of schedule, um, but. If there's nothing else at this moment uh, that comes up, uh, what do you think, Anna? Should we just uh, go to break? Yeah, so maybe um, we can uh, do the polls really quickly and then maybe go to the break so people can think about the poll results and get pumped about the things that Sherry uh, mentioned, the, you know, like the, the things that we're all here for, like out in the field uh, sample collection, or if folks are like, no, 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 I want to break now and I want it to be a little bit longer. That's also fine. So maybe um, let's use your reactions pane, everyone, if you've been on a call with me, you know I love emojis and reactions. So um, down on the bottom of your Zoom poll, you should have a reactions button. If you want to do a Zoom poll, uh, give us a green check mark. If you wanna take your break now, give us a coffee mug. Everyone's got to find the coffee mug. <laughs> yeah, the green chat marks on the left, the coffee mug's on the right. <laughs> okay, I'm seeing um, a couple, lots of green check marks. Okay, so let's do the poll, the Zoom polls really quickly. 
and we can talk about those. And then the rest of the time will be for discussion. So I'm going to launch the polls. You're going to have two questions and then um, we can go on a break. Um, okay. So the first one is uh, what types of I didn't fix the grammar. What types of water bodies have you or will you do most of your fish and shellfish sampling in? And this is a multiple choice. You can uh, click multiple answers. Um, if there's something else that we haven't listed, there's an other and maybe we can you can speak up and, and share what that is when we look at the results. And then the second question, if you want to advance to the next slide, Autumn, is... Um, what methods have you or will you use to collect samples? So there's a couple of things listed. There's a uh, uh, non-applicable, I'm not going to sample, or I don't know, <laughs> unsure. That's why I'm here, to learn about methods. Um, so we'll let that go for another minute, maybe. You want to just let that go through the break, and then we'll talk about it when we come back? Yeah, that sounds good. Let's do that. Um, how does, um, do we want to do a 20 minute break and still come back at 1040? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Have a nice break, y'all. See yeah. you at 1040. Thanks, everybody. Welcome back from your break, everyone. I'm going to, we've got 100% of folks have responded to the poll. So I'm gonna end the poll and then share the results. And we can walk, I can walk through them or Billy or Autumn, if you wanna talk through them, that's also welcome. Sure, so it looks like uh, the majority of everybody uh, has interest in rivers, creeks and streams. Um, they, they can be very challenging water body to collect fish in um, just because a fish can just move throughout the stream to, to get out of there uh, away from any kind of collection effort. Um, I can, when I'm going through the, the collection gear types and methods uh, coming up here, um, I can focus a little more on rivers and stream type application and um, just mention some things about it. Just uh, put a couple two cents in there for that. But um, they, uh, I, I would say probably your best uh, method is almost probably hook and line a lot of times. If it's a small stream, um, it can be very effective to move through a system and, you know, just out there with a fishing pole and, and, and the, the target bait that you want. Um, but yeah, that's, um, they, they can be very challenging. Um, and so I just want to uh, speak to the rest of the results because the the quiz thing, it doesn't show in the recording. So after rivers, creeks, and streams, we got folks um, interested in ocean, uh, bay, or coastal locations, oh, right. followed by lakes and reservoirs. Um, some folks are interested in estuary. And there's one person that said other. So um, if you want to say that aloud or add it to the chat, um, if you're interested in wanting to share that for context as we discuss later on, um, that's most welcome. And then methods, question two, looks like a mixed bag. <laughs> Everyone's doing a little bit of everything. And I didn't see the methods poll, but um, I think you- Oh, if you scroll down, you should be able oh. to see the results. <laughs> um, so most oh. folks are thinking hook and line um, followed by Grab, trap, gill nets, sane, other, and unsure, which is great. Nice. We'll cover all those. <laughs> okay. What What is the other? Is is that the dip net that Javier mentioned before, or is that something else? If whoever we didn't ask people to say that, so if folks want right. to share that, then they're welcome to. But this Sherry, we had done um, electroshock. I'm sorry, my audio is bad, so. Your audio is good now. <laughs> Maybe your computer just needed a break. <laughs> so weird. All right. Yeah, but we had done electroshock, whether it be okay. a backpack or whether it be a boat. We went out with fishing game in the boat. Perfect, Sherry. Is whoever put other for 
uh, locations. Are you willing to let us know uh, where you're where you're at with that? Guess it remains a mystery. <laughs> None yet, I think, is the response, which is totally fine. <laughs> All right. Cool. I think we're ready to dive into right. yeah, sample collection. Okay, so this is a part two. This is an actual collection. Um, so this is how we broke it up uh, in these five different areas. So we'll just uh, get into it. So go ahead. So <laughs> rolling up at the site, <laughs> really, uh, you know, you 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 come you come prepared for anything, um, and you roll up to the site and you see this um, this picture was a, a spot that we were planning to launch a boat here. Um, we found out really quick that that wasn't gonna happen. Um, so you, we, we kind of identify what challenges we may have here. And um, so what we typically will do is um, we'll scan for any potential problems. Uh, we'll walk the site, um, talk to locals, um, find out if there's any, any issues here. Um, while scanning, um, we look for hazards at the site, um, look for uh, snags, um, if there's excessive current, sandbars, uh, lack of a ramp. <laughs> um, if you're collecting in a beach area, um, you you know doing sains or um, gonna be interacting with the ocean at all. Uh, we look at wave heights. Um, if the, with the beach sane, you wanna look at kelp loading there's a lot of drift kelp or something like that that can make the seine really difficult. Um, you also want to note times, or, or sorry, the tides. Um, you know, if you're showing up at a at a time when the tides are going to be at their optimal height, or if you're going to be if tides are out and you need to say in a certain area, or however it may be. Um, we look at weather. So um, you know, you plan for everything, and then you get there, and there's a storm coming in. Uh, we've had several efforts where you get there and and it's snowing. Um, so it can make it very difficult. Um, so, uh, we kind of, you know, adapt for that. Um, so we stay with the plan, um, or we adapt based on conditions, um, may change your collection method based on your conditions. So you may not be out there electro fishing when you're, when it's raining, um, you might have to hook in line. Um, always have a backup plan, uh, is my, is the goal here. Um, so you want to, just make sure that um, that you can deploy more than one method at a site, um, depending on what you find. Um, so we will roll, we'll um, ready all our sampling containers. This is where we'll uh, make sure all our coolers are, are clean. Um, we have ice in our coolers, um, clean bags to store the fish in after collection, and they're just ready to use. Um, if we're doing water chemistry at a, a location, uh, we'll always collect the water chemistry before we coll collect bio or um, do the uh, fish collection. Um, this is just to um, ensure that you don't muddy up the water. So we one phrase that uh, one of our coworkers used to say, don't be sampling where you're trampling. Um, so you just want to make sure that you um, collect a clean representative water sample and you kind of, when you walk the, the area, you can look for that spot, you know, maybe, you know, a nice little access point where there's good flowing water. Um, so you clean, take your water chemistry sample before you collect your bio, or your uh, fish. Uh, discuss any concerns with the crew. So some things that you want to, uh, sorry, Autumn. <laughs> so you, you want to make sure that, um, you discuss your safety concerns with the crew. Um, it only takes, it, you know, if one person's not willing to do the work there and it's if it's unsafe and they they present a good argument, then, you know, we're out. Um, you know, safety is primary. Um, it's the the first concern, you know, anytime we're rolling up to the site. Um, you, you get all your uh, data, uh, collection devices, GPS permits, um, anything like that, put that all together and, um, make sure that's all ready to go. You uh, calibrate all your instrumentation. Um, so we we go through a whole set of calibrations on our YSI and all our gear. You pre-prep your gear. Um, so we will 
um, you know, tie up our buoys on our gill nets, um, get those ready, um, rig up fishing poles so we're ready to go when we get out there. And then uh, go ahead, Autumn. And so now we get into collection equipment. Um, so as a field sampler, I uh, kind of always discuss a little bit. I have stories about, about a lot of stuff and situations that I've experienced over the time. Um, so I could talk for days, so I'll try not to talk for days. Um, but uh, so uh, I wasn't sure. I don't think there was there was some interest in bivalve collection or mussels. Um, so basically, you're pulling this is pulling mussels off of rocks um, and you're doing this in an area and you want to make sure you're not just focused on one little spot. Um, you want to sample multiple beds in your location site. Um, and then one thing you got to remember too is we've come up to spots and you get out there and you start sampling and you look over and there's a little marker and you're like, oh, so it, Sometimes when you you know ask for access, you can ask, well, is there any surveys, current surveys going on? Because um, you don't want to collect on somebody's plot, <laughs> and then they come back, wow, well, there's high mortality rate here. Um, so yeah, so you want to make sure, be cognizant of that and and make sure you're not collecting in those spots. Um, also, you check tide heights. We we do go through checking tide heights and wave heights, um, and you never wear waders. That's what. The main key with bivalve collection: never wear waders. Um, the, if you wore waders and a wave hit you and knocked you in the water, it's just an anchor, and it would pull you down so fast. Um, you also you just kind of want to be aware that you may be swimming, um, so you try not to, but it does happen. Uh, we had a crew member that uh, was collecting mussels, and the wave hit the the breakwater and it it bounced off the breakwater and came back behind him. He was facing the ocean and it knocked him and it right into the water. He went into the water and then the wave washed him back on onto the rocks. So he was okay, but um, you really want to make sure you, you can get wet if needed. <clears throat> Not needed, but you don't want to. <laughs> so, um, and then hook and line, um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory as far as hook and line, but um, one of the things that we like to do is focus our baits on target species. Obviously, you want to rig up your your uh, poles so that you're fishing the best bait for those target species. And you know, local knowledge is huge. Um, a lot of times, we'll just stop at the local town and ask the the fly shop or the bait shop, you know, what's what's biting on, you know, who what's the latest and greatest and you know, usually walk out of there spending a little bit of money, but it's great because it you get to the site and you can throw whatever you're thinking it might be, and you throw what they're saying, and it you're pulling in fish. So, local knowledge is huge when it's hooked in line. Um, also, uh, <laughs> everybody has uh, their thing. You know, but they're some people say, "Oh, I don't fish that much," but they're catching fish. So they we always call that the hot stick. Um, so you, you know. Try and use that person as much as possible. Fish over here, fish over there. Let's switch to this and find these. And so um, somebody just dominates one of the trips and, and you know, they have the hot sticks. So, you know, really, uh, you know, focus on them trying to get the fish. <laughs> um, so another thing when catching fish is uh, we like to, after pulling the fish in, we want to ensure that we're not unhooking the fish and putting on the deck of the boat or on a pier just have uh, your sample containers ready to um, throw it in a bag, put it on ice, keep it clean. Um, you don't want to put it in the sand and things like that. So next. So fish traps and crayfish traps. Um, uh, so one of the big things for us um, when dealing with permits um, is all the all the buoys that states in your permit for fish traps and, and gill nets and things like that that have surface buoys is to label your permit information and contact information on the buoy. That way, if a, a angler or somebody comes by and looks at it, they can see that, they wanna call you and discuss what you're doing, they can. Also wardens come up and check them. And that way they don't have to pull the trap up. They can just look at the service float, see the permit number, contact information, and it's, you know, they can call you and discuss whatever they need to. Um, one thing, uh, 
using a bait that works. Uh, for some reason, crayfish were uh, really attracted to bacon wrapped hot dogs in uh, San Pablo Reservoir. So we had went out and bought bacon wrapped hot dogs and it just dominated the crayfish. We we got all our crayfish that we needed and bacon wrapped hot dogs were the, the bait of choice. So, um, you know, go with the bait that works um, is, a, is the main goal there. Uh, locate an area where you would like to um, see target species, where you would likely see them. Um, deploy Always deploy more than one trap. So one thing that happens is people like to check things out. And so they will pull your trap and uh, it'll you come back and it's on the shore or it's gone. Um, so it's a good idea to always deploy more than one trap because you may come back and find only one or none. So... Um, that happens quite a bit. Uh, you want to. Um, we always try to avoid heavy kelpie areas. So if you're deploying these uh, fish traps in the uh, ocean in the coast, um, sometimes you look for an area and you're like, oh, this is a great spot, but there's a lot of kelp. And what will happen is the wave action will tangle your float line in the kelp, and pulling that up is a monumental task. It's really difficult. Um, also, too, with a with, with wave action. It can actually move your trap quite a bit. Um, so we've uh, deployed a trap and then came back to to pull it and couldn't find it. And uh, it took us a long time to locate it. And uh, it was quite a ways away from where we had placed it. And there were no fish in it. So go figure. So uh, gill nets. Um, gill nets can be effective, very effective method, uh, but they are indiscriminate and cause high mortality rates in fish. Um, so they can be difficult to get to uh, get through on a permit, um, but they do work really well. Um, and one thing we like to try and do is choose a gill mesh size. So each one, you know, obviously has different sizes of uh, mesh. So you want to pick a mesh that will target the species and size lengths that you want and also location of in the water column is where you, you know setting it will will do that as well but you want if you want you know say larger trout um you you step up your mesh size to maybe inch and a half to two inch um and it, you'll avoid collecting the smaller fish or the really big fish so you can kind of focus in on you know being more selective in your mesh size and location as well but um uh, always make sure that uh, this is like the same thing as the uh, traps. So just make sure you look, you label up your buoys with your permits information and collection inf or uh, contact information. And then what we like to do is run the boat over an area that we're planning to deploy the net and kind of get an idea of the bottom type or what, what you're seeing on the bottom. We want to avoid things like snags, anything that could cause an issue, real high gradient uh, changes. Um, so if you had your topography is really bumpy and it looks like there's rocks and, you know, it has a little Canyon, you know, you're, you're set on across that and your gill net will actually sag and kind of lose its effectiveness. So you want to kind of pick an area that kind of shows, you know, a nice uniform bottom and, um, deploy there. And then when you go back over, a lot of times we'll, we'll do a track log and run that track log and, and kind of determine whether or not you're going to see this, what you're going to see there and then go back when you're deploying, you can run right back over that track log as you deploy. Um, and then, like I said before, um, when we deploy, we, we, we'll sit on the net uh, with hook and line and do hook and line effort um, while the net is in, in place because anglers love to run over nets. I, I don't understand the, the problem. It's open, big open lake and there's those little buoys and they go right through them. Um, so it happens quite a bit. Uh, if you're uh, so for rivers, um, if you're deploying in a high current area, or you know, say in the bay where you have you know these these tidal flux, um, and there's a lot of debris in the water, what what can happen is uh, if if you so if you get these high flows of, and big tidal changes, um, the debris will catch in your net, and it makes this what we call the, uh, an algae burrito. Um, and it just becomes this big tube of algae and debris and your net fails and it's really difficult to get all that out. If you're going to deploy again, you just have to make sure you shake it all out and, you know, any kind of debris in there be, when you're deploying it the next time, 
fish will see and avoid that area. So you got to really make sure it's clean and, and invisible for the fish. Next slide. Cast nets. So um, this is quite an art form. Um, it's really difficult to throw a cast net, but when you do it correctly, it, it it's very effective. Um, and again, these are this is an indiscriminate collection, so you're not really targeting a certain uh, species. You cast net out, and then whatever was there is collected. So you got to be careful of um, species of concern or uh, endangered species if you're cast netting in certain areas. Um, you can bring it in and not harm them very quickly. You know, I mean, if you do everything quickly and release them, um, but Fish and Game considers harassing, seeing, or any kind of uh, changing of the fish's uh, normal patterns as take. So even if you see the fish and, you know, disturb it in some way, they consider that a take and um, you have to report. Uh, always have... We always like to try to have multiple cast nets. Um, as you see here in uh, one of our coworkers, Dylan, throwing a cast net, there's there's sticks everywhere. Um, you will snag the cast net and hopefully you'll get it back. But it does happen quite a bit where we lose the cast net or just rip it completely and it's not usable. So a good thing is to always have multiple cast nets. Um, I use uh, YouTube uh as a uh practice uh so i look on youtube cast net throwing and you can find all different types of methods to throw a cast net uh whatever and i just found one that i like uh, other people throw it differently so um that's a, a good resource to just try and find you know oh how do i ca throw a cast net and you know one of the big things uh i always like to say is just practice you got to practice all the time and as autumn had said you know we're out there throwing cast nets on the um asphalt and you may you know oh i got it down and then you get tired and you throw a you know pancake and you're like oh bummer and so it it's it's one of those things you just really want to practice because the time that you're going to throw the cast net it may take only one effort uh to throw it in this one spot and once you throw it uh, if you throw a bad net then uh the fish is gone so you, they will, you know, you really want that net to be effective every time. Um, another thing with cast nets is um, if you're throwing into uh, rivers that are somewhat contaminated um, or I, I probably shouldn't say contaminated, but just, you know, questionable water quality, um, they, you, you're, it's, you're very, it's very personal. So you're, you're holding the net and it's really close to your face um you know debris and things get in the net and it, it it you really want to be careful um and as you see dylan here is he's got his fallies on um so it's it's very you, you the water will get on you and you'll be covered in it so um just make you know take that into consideration um also too uh it's a good idea to have a bucket with you um something clean that's been cleaned um so that you can deploy when you throw the cast net, you bring it in, your catch, you can, you know, uh, dump the net, the the fish into the bucket or an ice chest so they're not getting into the dirt. Um, so it keeps it, everything clean. You you kind of want to target basically areas that fish are held up in is, is your main goal. So sorry, go ahead. Uh, so beach sands. Um, <clears throat> so more help is better. <laughs> This is a tremendous amount of effort. Uh, uh, you're dragging a, a net through the ocean and through waves. Um, it can be very taxing. Um, what we usually try to do is we'll get out there and we'll test the current. So we'll sit and float out in the water and just see what the longshore current is doing. Um, you typically want to go with the current if it's really strong. Um, if it's not terribly strong, you can go either way. Um, but it kind of helps you determine which where, which way the net's going to push and what your drift will be. Um, one kind of nice tip is to have a beach wagon. So it has really big tires. Um, you can put your ice chest on there with it that your gill net is to, is in. Um, you can also push, put sampling, you know, the, uh, the cooler that you're going to put your fish in, you know, your clipboard, things like that, personal gear. Um, 
And that that's very helpful to just move around to different locations and then bringing the everything out, everyone's tired and you're, you got to carry a wet net full of stuff. And so uh, beach wagons are nice. Um, another thing we try not to do is drag the, the net in the sand. It'll, it'll actually hold, it'll, it'll, basically the high, it's just high friction and it'll, it'll grab the net and it'll, it's really difficult. So you, if you see here in the picture, um, we have a guy holding it, he's standing in ankle deep water and he's keeping the net off the off sand, trying to make it so that it won't drag, makes it easier to pull. Um, another thing, <laughs> what, uh, you know, having more people is better. We'll typically have a public relate public relations person. So this is a, just a, a real visible um, thing to do on a beach. Um, people tend to come over and like, what are you doing? And what's this for? And are you sure this, are you allowed to do this? And so there's a lot of questions that come about. Um, Anna, that flyer is awesome for this. Um, we hand it out quite a bit and uh, it just gives them information on what we're doing and you know where the data is and kind of a general idea of, of the project. So that's awesome. This, that, Beach sanding is probably the primarily one of the biggest uh, uh, things that we will actually use that flyer for. It's uh, very effective. So thank you for that. Um, okay, go ahead. So otter trawls. Um, this also could be very uh, effective uh, collection method, um, but it also has potential to damage sensitive habitats such as eelgrass. So um, you wanna be careful where you're trawling. Uh, typically we'll do is we'll run a path uh, to scan the bottom to see where it, what, what's down there before we drag the net. And uh, that just gives an idea of what um, we'll see, you know, if we're gonna actually snag something or not. Um, in general, easier to trawl into the wind or up into the current. Um, it just kind of keeps the net open and, and is a little bit easier to deal with. Um, some some tips that you can find online, but I'll just say I'm here. Typical rope length, rope length uh, ratio to depth ratio is um, so how much rope you have out um, to the net to the actual depth of water that you're trawling in uh, is three to one. So um, you will, when you get to a spot and you know how deep it is, you can adjust your your depth to uh, or length of rope to your depth. Average speed of trawl, um, we typically trawl at 1.5 to 2 knots, so it, it kind of feels slow, but you you really want it, that trawl to touch the bottom and drag on the bottom to collect your bottom species. Um, we, we tend to have, uh, uh, we're looking at safety with this, with these trawls, and we all always have an air horn and um, clippers, so um, whatever, it, we, um, sometimes we'll have a cable that's attached to the ropes, so we'll have clippers to um, cut that cable in case we get snagged really bad. Um, we've had issues where we're in the bay and the current's going out and there's wind and we're going the opposite way of the current or going with the current, which is probably not the best thing. And that's kind of why I suggested that. Um, but, you know, it happens and we snagged up really hard on something and one thing we don't do is we don't power up on it because you'll destroy your net. Um, so, you know, you kind of stop your trawl and you, you know, pulled it in and try and unhook it, but we, we couldn't get it. And the, um, the trawl was actually uh, stopped us and the current and the wind were, was pushing so hard that it was pulling down the stern of the boat. And we actually had, it was, it was, we had kind of a quick, uh, think quickly and, and we ended up cutting the line and then going back and pulling the floats, uh, the tail float buoy and getting our net back. But um, it was a little scary at first. And so um, it's nice to have those cover cutters ready. And then the air horn is just to warn people that are coming by, what are you doing? You know, like, well, we're, you know, and it's just kind of wake people up if they're out there boating and they're coming right at you. And uh, so next slide. Uh, pull spears. So uh, this is, uh, this also can be, this is very, actually a really effective marine method. Um, and um, divers can actually, they, they can select the size and the species they need. So um, it's, it's a great method if you can dive there, you know, and it's, a viz is, is decent, so you can see. 
um, but it also exposes your dive crew to, um, you know, the, the uh, marine hazards and just the effects of diving in general. Um, so hazards like uh, in, you know, as far as mammal life um, or marine life, we've, we've uh, you know, fish spines, um, you know, scorpion fish. Uh, we've, we've had a few people get spined by scorpion fish and it's very painful. And uh, so uh, same with sea urchin spines. Uh, we actually had, we were diving in um, Point Loma and we had a thresher shark come up and was circling. And so all of a sudden the fish disappeared and we're like, wow, there was fish here just a few minutes ago. What happened? And um, we had a, we heard a, an engine revving. And so one of the divers, you know, we always have a recall a way to pull the divers out of the water if needed. Um, so we were determined that, oh, you know, before we dove, we're like, rev the engine and that'll recall us. And so we all came back to the boat and we're like, what happened? And they're like, oh, there's a thresher shark circling. And so um, these are things to think about when you're diving you know, have a way to communicate to your divers that, hey, there's a situation we need to move. Um, we were in Diablo, Diablo Power Plant uh, collecting fish, which is right out of San Luis Obispo. And uh, it's, uh, it, it was probably one of the scariest situations we've ever had with diving. Um, we got, just got back to the boat, got, all got back on board and we looked over the side and there was a hemorrhaging uh, harbor seal that had just been bit by a white shark. And it was right next to the boat. So uh, we were swimming around with them. And uh, it was one of those situations where you just kind of are thankful that you got all your fish. <laughs> Didn't have to go back in. Um, and the other uh, dangers uh, with diving is just, the, you know, physical stress and mental stress um, for the samplers, you know, um, CO2 loading and, and just different uh, different issues or nitrogen loading, excuse me. Um and so that those are things that that can impact your crew. Um, also, uh, kelp entanglements and, and currents and things like that are you know. So it's it's a it's a little more uh, hazardous collection, but it can be very effective. And then um, when we do collect fish with spears, we like to target um, what we call headshot. So um, it dispatches the fish really quickly, but it also uh, preserves the uh, integrity of the tissue. We don't. Uh, compromise anything there uh, as far as testing for contamination we don't want to spear the gut or spear the side of the fish and you know, we just try to focus on a on a on a headshot it doesn't always happen um, labs uh, that uh, at least our lab um, has a, a policy that they don't take any tissue near those entry wounds so um, that's kind of a uh, uh, it, it can be difficult to get, to get a headshot, but it's it's what we try to. Okay, go ahead. Next slide. Ah, so electrofishing. Um, as far as collection device, this is probably the the most fun of collection. Um, this very can be very effective tool. Um, it poses minimal uh, um, harm to the fish when when set up correctly, um, and it, it just is very selective. You can pick. And choose what species you need, um, what size ranges you need. Um, what it is is a general idea of electrofishing. Is it electrofishing uses a generator to pulse um, current into the electricity into the water. The boat. Um, so if you see in the picture, you'll see the boom out there. That's the positive, and then the the boat is the negative. It creates a field of electricity that goes about you know roughly ten feet, depending on the conductivity, and um, temperature of the water will and what it does is it makes the muscle of the fish contract and the swim bladder of the fish will actually just allows it to float to the surface and then you just collect it with your net so um, it's very effective um, if the fish that you uh, see you don't need you can either pull your foot off the pedal or just keep moving and once the current passes it it'll swim away so it, it's very effective um, some of the downsides to electrofishing um, is it's very expensive. Uh, boats are pricey and they're very pricey to maintain. So um, it's it's a real specific uh, to, it's, it's, it's there's Smith Root and I think there's maybe a couple other eight, uh, groups that actually make the e-boats. So it can, you know, Smith Root is always backlogged on things and, and a lot of their equipment can be very expensive. Um, also too, 
uh, it requires extensive tr training. Um, Smith Root gives a class uh, that we've all attended and it goes over safety and, um, you know, set up for uh, your e-boats and backpack shockers and things like that. Uh, an e-boat can kill you. Um, you're using a, a lot of uh, current and uh, amperage um, and it can harm the fish if not set up correctly. So we really want to make sure you're properly trained um, when using it. Or if you're on a fishing game boat, which is a nice feature, you know, they, they've all gone through this training as well. Um, so typically uh, when we get to a spot, uh, we set up the e-boat uh, according to the most sensitive species for that, that site, for that water body. So uh, a lot of times that's based around um, trout or salmon. Um, they're, they're the most sensitive. So we'll, all our settings will be based on that. Uh, the more tolerant species, we'll still see them, but we're not harming the, the what potentially we could see. So um, you just want to make sure that you set it up for that. Um, and then one of the ideas of e-boating is that you um, always, uh, you move through the water, you never stay in one spot. So we're always moving um, through a, uh, these habitats, these different habitat types, like say like, you know, a bunch of tree branches down. Um, we'll go in there, we'll move, we'll put our chakra on, move through the system and then move away. So you don't want to sit on a spot because um, you can harm a fish if you end up sitting there. Um, also too, you can find, you know, turtles and um, otter or uh, not otters, uh, river otters and uh, beavers. Sometimes, you know, if, so you want to make sure that you, if you do see them or anything like that, mammal, that you can pull up the shocker and get out of there. Um, habitats uh, are usually typically shallow that you're looking at. You can't really shock very deep. Um, you can bring uh, catfish with certain settings. You can bring catfish from the depth with a certain pulse that actually kind of teases them up. Um, you could also push fish into uh, coves as you're moving in. Like, so right here, kind of, this is actually what we're doing is we're, um, he's got the foot on, his, on the foot on the pedal and we're kind of pulsing the shock button and kind of moving in the direction towards the end of this cove and kind of pushing fish into that area. And, um, you know, if they try to come back out, they'll, they'll feel that pulse and end up getting shocked. But, you know, as you're moving out that the edges of that shock, they're, they're getting the, um, the little tingle and they're moving away. So it's a way of kind of hurting them into a spot where you can actually collect. Um, one of the things with e-boats is they do fail quite a bit. Even the most maintained e-boat has issues. Um, we try to plan for it, but it inevitably you're out there and um, a cooling pump for your generator uh, goes and you spend a little bit of time trying to clean it. Um, we had one situation where it took us a half a day to get to this site and it was all uh, dirt roads and four wheel drive roads. We actually get out there um, get to the site, go to hit the shocker and it doesn't shock. And so we spent another hour um, looking for this one little wire that had vibrated loose because of, you know, our travel on this dirt road. So um, it, it can be, it can be troublesome, but they, they are a great method of collection if you can use them. So yeah, so those are the kind of the collection methods. Any questions on those? So e-boats and streams and rivers are very effective as well. They, um, they, uh, the larger rivers, um, you know, you have a current that it's, that's pushing you through the system. And so you can really cover a lot of area and uh, target those fish species that you're looking into. Um, so it, uh, you, you can apply the, the electro fishing on rivers and streams. Uh, big streams. <laughs> you you mentioned on the slide it said that they were highly regulated and I know there's been talk of you know we can't electrofish because of these conditions. Do you just want to like highlight the conditions sure. we look for? Yeah sorry I missed uh, I should have said something a little more about that but sure. yeah so for us uh, a lot of our uh, permits come back with a, um, a, a temperature and conductivity uh, restriction and so if the water temperature is over this range or the conductivity is over this range, you can't shock at all. Um, and, and this is also true for the majority of these methods. 
So in even hook and line and gill netting, all these, uh, they actually have temperature um, restrictions. So if, if the water body is really warm, um, they'll set a, a temperature uh, restriction. And so the, that restriction, you kind of want to use that, uh, those restrictions to kind of plan how you're going to come in and do your sampling if you're going to sample early in the season versus later in the season. So that can kind of mold how you're going to actually do your sampling. Um, but yeah, they, they all have some sort of, of temperature restriction. And then the e-boating has a conductivity, uh, obviously, because you're putting current into the water, uh, highly, highly conductive uh, water bodies. They don't want you shocking in. So um, it could potentially harm fish. Thank you, Anna. And then for anyone else, if um, you've used any of these methods or you approach them differently, um, that those, those are all valuable things if you feel comfortable sharing. Again, this is being recorded and will be posted on the webpage, but if you don't want me to um, share certain parts of the recording, we can cut things out. Even if you guys just want to share a story, I, I'm all about it. <laughs> stories. I um, There's always a situation that you thought, oh, we were not going to make this happen and it's not going to happen. And then one of our phrases is, you know, we adapt and overcome. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it may be, you know, zip tying this to that or, or whatever, electrical tape and some sticks and duct tape. And, uh, you know, there's always something that, you know, goes wrong and you try and make it work. Yeah, Sherry, I see you unmuted. I'm debating on whether to, to I mean, basically, um, the last time that we went out and did sampling, we were out with um, we were out with fish and game, and we were out with three tribes um, staff from three tribes in the Clear Lake area. And what was really nice about that is that we were able to take turns. It, we were out with the 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 e boat, so able to take turns being in different different um, areas of the boat and learning how to do it. Um, we were able to, we, we got the, the largest catfish that the fish and game warden had ever seen. And, um, it was so big that when we put it into the well, all of the other fish in there moved away. <laughs> <laughs> and, amazing. um, and if it hadn't been shocking, we would have probably won awards, but because it wasn't a line, we could not be counted for, you know, largest fish caught in that in California <laughs> right. for that species but um it, and it, it it was really there was a lot of concern that we had in starting to do that because we didn't want to damage the fish but it really did not seem as they were as they were leaving they were just kind of a little like hey what just happened that was weird and they were swimming away it seemed just fine so right. if anyone has any worries about that it seemed a lot less um dangerous for the fish than having a hook in their jaw that you have to pull out um it also gave us the opportunity to see um, when we were pulling the species, we could see that a fish had maybe a sore on it. And so we might want to take that to find out if there's any kind of path and, you know, any kind of parasites or anything going on. So it gave us a, an opportunity to be very selective. If we saw one that had damage to a fin and he wasn't going to do well anyways, we could take that one. Um, and it, it did highlight the the sheer quantity of invasives i mean we're counting them when we're out there but to see when you shock and see all of those fish come up like the carp etc it is it, just it was overwhelming with how many were coming up at how unbalanced you could see how unbalanced the water body is um yeah, whatever's there you're gonna see whatever's there and that's one of the nice things with electro fishing is is you'll see what fish are in that area yeah um, what else? Um, yeah, we were also that the area has a has the the hitch as you know, I'm seeing some familiar faces in here that know about the hitch um, already. Um, but that hitch, um, there's only you can't take that at all. They're endangered. Um, and the, for the the we the we did have someone out there from one of the tribes that had a, a scientific take on the hitch. So we were all leaning on on them. We were really glad that they could come out with us. And we tried to take as minimal amounts of those as possible. We were thinking about, for example, if we're looking for mercury or contaminants that we could choose. We already had a workshop previously to this that you can go back and look at. But we could, you can choose to take largemouth bass, for example, and then extrapolate it out to see if that means that that water body is high in, 
in fish with those toxins. And then if you only did compare to a few hitch, you don't have to take as many to get um, like a fish consumption advisory or anything, but they're not really catchable anyways um, for consumption unless you're, um, yeah, anyways. So that's not the, that's not a public, a, a fish people could take in public, but it was, it was a, a really good experience. We've now, I've gone out uh, three different times with um, agencies to do that kind of um, fish gathering. We found it to be really, really good. The other question, um, I do have a question. It has to do with um, um, if you're going to be um, using backpacks. I've never done that before. Does anyone have experience with that? And how does that work? And then the other one was like uh, those E where you can put, you can find out what, what species are in the water body um, through eating. those boxes. That's something that's might be interesting to people as well. Yeah. So um, I could, I could speak to some, both of those if you would like. Um, please, yeah, please. That would be great. Okay. So backpack shocking. Um, it's the same idea. You know, you still have your, your, the, the permit restrictions are, are, are very similar um, temp and conductivity and you would, typically use um, one or two backpack shockies, depending on how big your area is. Um, you can set up uh, a barrier net uh, below the, you know, downstream of you and uh, upstream of you. And then you can work th through that system and, and they can not escape and so you can see what's there. Um, if you want, uh, you know, to, to minimize their escaping the area. But um, what we usually do is we'll, have our you know backpack shockers going and then we'll have multiple netters um you know kind of staggered on either side and um you know you're rolling your uh your so you have a, a shocker basically on your back it's it's either gas or um uh battery powered and then there's a wand which is your positive and then you have what they call a rat tail and that's what you're rolling in is your negative and you roll that out to one side of the habitat and then you use your wand to kind of wand through that habitat as you as you wand through fish will pop and the netters can can net and then they'll have somebody behind you that's your your live well um, and they're holding a bucket full of water and they can you know pull put the fish in if you need to take that one or release if you need to release um so yeah, you just basically you know moving through the system back and forth depending on how big your your water body is, um, you you know you can move up one side and then move the other side and kind of target habitats that your um, target species kind of are present in. So, and then eDNA, um, I think somebody put something in the chat as far as eDNA, but um, Smith Root also makes a uh, eDNA sampler. Um, the thing with eDNA is you can't really, you, it's more of a presence in the system and you're not exactly sure where in the system upstream, you know, how far upstream um, this species is, but uh, it's taking uh, volumes of water in a syringe or the Smith root system is actually a, a peristaltic pump and it uh, just draws water in and they have a filter that collects um, the, the uh, DNA onto the filter. And then um, the syringe device is the same idea as you're just pumping, manually pumping into this uh, this filter. And then you send that out to an, e, an eDNA lab and then they look for, you know, these different species uh, in that in that uh, filtrate. So um, it, it, it is a way to, to show presence of uh, a species. So a lot of a lot of people use it for, you know, listed species to see if they're there. Um, so it's a, it's a, just a way to show a presence of, of them. Yeah. And the link that I added to the chat, Billy, is a link to the Swamps eDNA project where we regularly oh. partner with tribes and other groups and send kits, eDNA kits for free, and we'll pay for the analysis. Well, um, I think there's a data sharing component. So it is something to consider, but be aware of that. Uh, but many tribes, I think some folks on this call might already have been like plugged into that, but it's a resource at your disposal um, to all California tribes. Yeah. And those, that's the Jonas Adventure kits? I yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not my project. I need to dive yeah. in. I haven't been there recently, but yes, I think so. And and um, someone had mentioned this, I think it was Sherry, the, the survey one, two, three. 
So they they utilize it's it's uh so they actually have apps on your phone. So you have the Jonas Adventure app and the Survey One Two Three, and this is kind of ties into the Swamp program. Um, and and your you you the Survey One Two Three, you're giving all this information about your site uh, that that helps in locating where this data is coming from, and that goes into the database. And then your Jonas Adventure Kit um, kind of takes some information from you. And when you send, and they give you a, a little pack and it has a syringe and a little filter and you, you know, filter as much volume of water as you can until the filter clogs. You put the filter in the little shipping package, you send it out and then you get your data. So it's a real easy way, um, not that expensive. And um, you, they have a whole suite of, of uh, targets that they, they uh, you know, give you information on. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great little system. And if there are no other questions, I think maybe there's still some goodies on the sample processing and things like that that you wanted to cover. So yeah, maybe we can move on to that. So um, Sherry, you had a question before about sample processing. Um, <clears throat> let me start by saying we've mentioned several times the live well um, or a bucket to have things in. Um, all of our e-boats are equipped with a live well, but also at least one of our whalers is, which is a really nice feature. It's a way to keep your fish. And most of the projects that we work on have very specific size ranges for the, the target fish and so and certain numbers of fish within each of those. So a lot of times we'll just, you know, grab fish that we've shocked or otherwise caught and put them in the live well. And then um, we kind of get an idea of what size classes we have, but then at the end of it, we can only, we then are able to only keep the ones that we actually need. So it's a nice way to be even more selective. Um, so once we've spent our time on the water body and gotten the fish that we need for that particular site, then we start to worry about how do we take it to the lab and how do we keep it, um, the, the sample integrity so that your fish isn't starting to decay by the time it gets to the lab. And, and um, usually in your co-op, you set up preservation on holding time um, timelines. Um, uh, the EPA says that um, samples need to be frozen within 24 hours of collection. That may actually be less depending on the size of your fish. So sometimes we collect prey size fish and those need to be frozen pretty quickly. Otherwise they start to degrade. Um, then, um, you know, for analysis, it's a different whole time, but we're not talking about analysis. So I won't get into that. Um, so we use, uh, sample data sheets out in the field. Um, they are partially filled when, before you do your collection or while you're driving the boat or whatever, and they have the site information, the date, time, et cetera, um, all of your standard um, sample tracking uh, information. But specific to fish, we use um, tags, and you can see there's, um, there's a tagging gun made by, by Floy Tag on the um, side of the screen there. Um, this is a system that we found works really well. Each of those tags um, is uniquely identified by not only a color, but also a successive numbering system. So we use a letter and then a four digit number. And each one of those um, goes into the larger fish um, and what Billy was saying before with spearfishing applies here, you try not to um, contaminate your sample. So we tag, we like to tag through the eye and sometimes it goes into other parts of the head that we're not gonna be using. Um, when you have smaller fish, sometimes you can't do this. So you have to either individually wrap them or find another way to uniquely identify them. Now, the reason that we're uniquely identifying them is because we've found over the years that when you do uh, length measurements in the field, once the sample freezes, the muscle fibers either expand or contract and it's not consistent. So if you're trying to match field lengths 
with an individual fish to dissect in the lab for the project, you can't always do that without another method. And so a number of years ago, we came up with using the tag systems and it makes things a lot easier. So because of the discrepancy in specifically with um, lengths and fish, we always try to take the field measurements in the lab or in the field. Um, I should say the fish measurements in the field. <laughs> um, they can be done in the lab and we, um, through the swamp database, um, there's a way to identify where the measurement was done. Um, and that's something that the swamp team set up when they were starting with the tissue work. Um, all of this, we are still actually hand reporting on our data sheets right in the rain paper. Um, we've discussed moving to electronic means and um, there's some pros and cons for that, but I'm not gonna get into depth on that. <laughs> um, so sometimes you have to partially dissect your fish in the field. Um, a good example of this is when we get what we call a lunker. <laughs> you get a really big uh, carp or catfish and you can't put it in a smaller bag. And um, you know, part of my responsibilities here is making sure that we can appropriately store samples. So um, in the freezer while we're waiting for the dissection and analysis. So the big thing with doing field dissections is trying to keep it clean. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, dirt or whatever. It, it often means keeping the gut contents off of the filet, um, you know, keep keeping the cutting boards uh, clean between discrete fish. Sometimes that's individuals, sometimes that's by species if they're all gonna be composited. A lot of times when we're in the field, that decision hasn't been made yet. And so we try to keep everything discreet. Um, we put down a plastic garbage bag over our um, cutting board, um, but with microplastics, that may be a problem. So one of the things that you have to consider that we're always taking into account is, you know, what are we measuring in terms of contaminants and what are the things that could possibly um, skew those contaminant results? And microplastics is, is definitely one of those contaminants of emerging concern that um, we're having to adjust how we do things accordingly. Um, and little things too, like um, years ago, we used Teflon to wrap fish. And now we don't because PFAS and a lot of those other compounds are things that we are um, not only archiving for, but actively measuring. And so you try to eliminate those. Um, but also, um, so now we use foil, but we always make sure to use the dull side of the foil and not the shiny side to touch the fish. Now, I know fish have that nice mucus wrapping, <laughs> wrapping, um, covering that protects themselves. Um, and yes, when it's getting processed in the lab, that usually gets washed off, but you still don't want to be introducing things as much as you can. The reason we use the duller side is because the shinier side has a little bit more um, oils, plastics, there's all kinds of stuff in foil. So we try to minimize that as best we can. Um, basically, when you're dealing with fish themselves, most of the time we're dealing with the filet and so we're taking the skin off anyway, but that's not always the case. Um, and when you're doing other organisms, bivalves, crayfish, you might be using the entire thing. So we try to keep all of that in mind. Um, then one of the tricks that we've learned is um, when you're all said and done, you've got individuals or groups of fish wrapped in foil. <clears throat> the smaller fish, you need to make sure that you keep them separated by foil so we don't end up with what we call a bait ball is in the lab that makes it really difficult to dissect so we're always trying to balance that too 
<clears throat> but we put that inside a plastic Ziploc style bag. Um, then we put in a, a paper tag and we use right in the rain paper typically if we've got it. Um, and that tag goes between the first bag and another bag. Um, so your fish are individually tagged, your bag is labeled, and then we even label the outside bag. That's typically done with a Sharpie. Um, the reason we do that inside label is because the Sharpie rubs off, um, but it's also really important that that label with all of its inks and potential metals contaminants don't go inside with the actual fish. It needs to go between bags. Um, so then um, the fish, after they've been processed, we store them on dry ice until we can carry them to the lab. Um, up until now, they've probably been on wet ice or if they're coming right from the live well, they didn't even make it that far. <laughs> um, so wet ice is great for that first 24 hours, but then your fish need to be frozen. Bivalves are the same. They need to be frozen as quickly as you can. Um, the exception to that is when you're looking at algal toxins. It's, um, I haven't done a whole lot of work with this, but it's my understanding that um, if you're looking at algal toxins in flesh, you cannot freeze your sample. So again, you got to know what your um, what the requirements are for the analytes that the project is interested in. Hey, Autumn, is yeah. there a temperature range that's ideal for our freezers that you can share? Oh, um, our freezer is actually just a standard freezer temperature. So it's approximately four degrees Fahrenheit or negative 20 in Celsius. Back to you, Billy. All right. So um, this is something that uh, we uh, we do at every we we do at every site, and uh, we cover every every gear that that we use, every piece of gear we use. So uh, one thing is um, we realize that the nature of our work, uh, traveling from lake to lake, puts us at risk at transporting invasive species. Um, because of this, we take decontamination very seriously and are meticulous about following uh, the protocols laid out in our permits. Um, it's you, it, we're a vector and um, we don't want to bring any coagula or any sort of invasive uh, species to another water body and, um, you know, cause issues there. Um, so one thing that we like to try and follow is what they call best practices. Um, so we, um, whenever we can, we will follow these rules. Uh, so these are the rules when working in one water body per day, um, decontaminate at the end of the day. So if you're only in one water body, you still decon at the end of your sampling effort. Um, if sampling multiple water bodies, use separate equipment uh, for each site. Uh, this is not always possible when you're using a boat, uh, but we will decontaminate the boat before going into another water body. Um, Always decontaminate the boat after a water bottle, regardless of whether you're sampling another lake that day. Um, we just, end of our day is filled with decontaminating all our gear. Um, this is very hard on our gear. Uh, we end up uh, going through waders and um, anything that can be consumed by chemical or uh, hot pressure washing or uh, any drying or anything, uh, freezing and uh, they, it, it puts a lot of damage to the gear and, and it wears it out really quickly, but, um, they're replaceable. So, um, if you bring in an uh, invasive species into water body, <laughs> it, it, uh, just causes a lot of problems. So we know we try not to be that person. Um, one thing, uh, you, we don't use, uh, uh, felted sole boots. So a lot of waders will come. Well, they used to come with little felt bottoms, so it's not slippery on on algae rocks. Uh, those are very hard to decontaminate, and they collect uh, species invasive species real easy. Uh, snails can get up in there and and hold up in a felted boot, um, and it's really difficult to get out. So we always use rubber sole boots. Um, we just scrub everything. Everything gets scrubbed really well. 
um, and you know gets sprayed clean. Um, some specific uh, decontamination procedures that are current this year or uh, as of 2022, um, the Fish and Wildlife will always uh, include these in your permit. Um, it'll be attached to uh, the permit that once they approve it, when when you go to the website, you'll see the decontamination procedures, and it'll also be listed in your permit uh, in in the notes and the conditions. Um, so this 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 the the current uh, con, um, procedures are um, uh, hot pressure washing. Uh, so at a certain temperature for a certain amount of time, um, you're pressure washing whatever it is that was contact with water. Um, there's freezing. Uh, so you you freeze your gear for a certain amount of time at a certain temperature. There's drying. Drying is just, you know, at a certain temperature for a certain amount of time. And then there's chemical treatment, which is a, uh, it's currently a Vircon. That's a viricide that the veterinarians use. Um, so it's kind of nasty. You don't really want to get it on yourself. So you, you have to be really careful. Um, but it is something that you can use, um, if you're going from, uh, multiple sites in a day, we use the, uh, hot pressure wash or the, uh, the Vircon, and you can do this at a, at like, we like to use a self-car wash, um, because everything's contained. They have a hot a pressure washer. And uh, everything is contained in their sewer system and goes straight to the city sewer, which is basically the uh, protocol for Vircon. Um, but yeah, it's it's it, it's a difficult uh, process to go through, and and you're tired at the end of the day, but it's critical um, to keep make sure that you don't transfer anything. Uh, some some uh, requirements at at. Uh, Certain water bodies have their own special requirements. We've had uh, several water bodies that actually require us to leave our, our boat for several weeks at a site just to make sure that we uh, didn't use it in something else. Uh, they also will come down and send somebody to our, to our location and watch us hot pressure wash our boat. Um, so some water bodies can be very restrictive. So you want to make sure that... Uh, you know what they're requiring when you uh, ask for access. They usually tell you pretty quick what they uh, would like you to do. Um, but yeah, it can. You, there's a lot of hoops sometimes uh, as far as decontamination. So that's about it for that. Okay, here we are rounding out. I always like to say, and everyone around here will tell you that I do it frequently. The work is not done until your data are submitted. <laughs> Um, I am a stickler for this. Uh, to me, um, you know, we're we're contracting with the state, and I always say we shouldn't be paid until we've actually finished the work, which is the data entry side. So, um, you take those field data sheets if you had a paper version like we do, and you get them into whatever format is required for your particular program. A lot of our work is swamp, and so you can we put our stuff into the swamp data templates. Um, and then the big step here from my perspective is not just the data entry, but we do 100% checks to make sure that we don't have any transcription errors because these data make the foundation of the rest of your program. So um, I, that's super important. And then um, part of the data recording, as Wes mentioned earlier in the permit section, that has to be reported back to the permitting agencies that, that we um, work with. So luckily, in our case, the Swamp Database has a lovely query that I can pop out and send to Billy, and he takes care of all of that for us. But, um, you know, it's not complete until your data are in. <laughs> questions yeah so sherry you added like lots of yummy goodness in the chat and i wanted to flag that and also invite you to speak to it um verbally if if you'd like to it depends on if you can hear me is my computer still working correctly oh it's not it's not okay um uh, 
Bummer. Okay, I'll read uh, what you shared and then because uh, I just it's good to consider. So consider what portions of the fish your community is eating. Example, while agencies are interested in species most commonly eaten and the filet, so we remove the, the head, fats and guts, that may not be what your people eat. So this is a good reason for tribes to do the sampling and send out for analysis yourselves. Um, and also cultural use portions of fish. So example, sturgeon has high levels of mercury in the sticky part right under the skin. So sampling the specific use or areas of consumption of a fish might be good to do too. So um, yeah, just wanting to acknowledge that we, in our main statewide program, we sample and collect in a certain way for certain reasons. And that might not always align with what tribal needs are. So just flagging that difference. Hopefully I captured that well, Sari. Yeah, so um, Sherry also mentioned um, CEDIN versus WQX entries. So a lot of tribes, as you know, submit your data to the US EPA via WQX um, and are not required to submit to CEDIN. And the next um, training in September, we're gonna dive deeper into that, that discussion specifically. Um, because it's it's a challenge and we we know it's a challenge and we're working on it but it's um you know not something we can tackle in the 11 minutes left, left of this of this training uh but yeah it's we're we're getting there are there any other questions um or anything folks want to share regarding field um things before we move on to closing Oh, I asked Autumn in the chat um, about archiving of samples and if there's a difference in freezer temperatures versus like regular storage to process samples versus archiving samples. Um, and Autumn, do you wanna just share what you wrote? Sure, sure. Um, we store archive samples for up to five years just at the negative 20 C or the standard freezer temperature. Um, there are places where you can pay to store samples for much longer, and those are at like negative 80 or negative 90 C. Um, I know that the Bay RMP utilizes that. Uh, the statewide program did that one year, but it was really cost prohibitive for us because it's an annual fee to keep those up there. Um, but also the volumes or the mass that you can store is a lot smaller. So for instance, I believe that the Bay RMP, I think they have like a 12 gram storage, but then also a three gram storage, depending on what analyses they're looking for. Whereas typically for the short-term storage of the, the statewide programs, we're looking at 30 to 60 grams. Um, depending on what size jars we have available. Cool. Thanks, Adam. Any other questions or comments for our instructors or anything you want to share from your experience? Okay, then we'll we'll get into closing. Oh wait, 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 there's a chat. Um Okay, so Sherry says that there may be an opportunity to support lab fees for fish and shellfish through the Tribal Beneficial Use Strategic Planning Caucus later this year. Um, and that tribal working group will be discussing how to use those funds in, our, in their meeting next month. So flagging that for folks, next month being uh, April, uh, just in case you're viewing this recording, April 2024. Um, okay. Thanks, Jerry. That's a good flag. So, um, yeah, before you jump off, we wanted to say thanks. I wanted to say thanks to Wes, Autumn, and Billy for kind of emptying their brains <laughs> for us and sharing all the hot tips and the things that they think about when going to the field. But then everyone who has been able to join and stay for the whole training or come for parts, or if you're going to watch this recording, we really want this information to be useful and, and be shared and get out there. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Um, just wanting to remind you all that the slides and recordings for the January and February trainings are already posted on the training series webpage. 
and I'm going to start processing this baby after we hang up today. So I'm hoping it'll be posted on March 22nd, but anyone that registered for this training will receive an email with those links probably before then. Um, and then at the next, we're going to take a break um, because folks are going out in the field and we didn't want to schedule trainings when you're doing field things. So um, we'll come back in September um, and talk about the quality assurance and quality control and data submission um, to Swamp Seed-In, but we're also going to talk about WQX during that training. Um, and then in October to December, we're going to be talking about, okay, you've got your data. Now, how do you interpret it? How do we interpret it from the bioaccumulation monitoring program's perspective? And then um, Wes Smith uh, from OEHA is going to come back and talk about how they develop their fish advisories October to December. The dates, we'll pick those probably in September. Um, I also want to flag that in the next week or so, I'm going to be sending everyone an email with a just quick survey. Um, I think it's less fewer than five questions, um, but just to see how these trainings have been for you. And, um, you know, if there's more information you want to see in the future training so that we can make these as useful as possible moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so... Um, these are just resource slides that are going to be included at the end of the slide deck. So if you want to talk to the bioaccumulation monitoring program, myself, or you want to set up a time to meet with Autumn, <laughs> really or less, or anyone, any one of our speakers, um, go ahead and fill out that form and we can facilitate those conversations. Uh, the safety work group meet list is um, where we talk about all of this, many of these things or how we implement all this work on a quarterly basis. Um, so there's links to the meetings page and the email list. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I have been keeping track of things that folks have been sharing behind the scenes. So um, the, the links that have been shared in the chat will also be in the slide deck um, and shared. And I think that's it. We can go back to the thank you slide. There's a couple more slides, but those have been the same, um, for every training. So thanks again. And, uh, I, we really hope this has been helpful for you and please complete the survey to tell us what else would be helpful moving forward. Um, and have a good afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thank thanks, you all. Everyone. Bye.